forging cyber, forging cyber security experts. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV. Now, our free preview of Secure Ninja's online Sensei series has generated such a positive reaction that we've decided to give away every single module from this Cyber Kung Fu course featuring Larry Greenblatt, Tom Upjagrove, and me. If you like what you see and would like to experience a Secure Ninja training course in person at any of our training locations, we have some amazing time-sensitive specials for you. Just visit secureninja.com specials for all of the do not miss deals. And now, here is your free module from Cyber Kung Fu for the Certified Ethical Hacker version 8. Enjoy! All right, module 19, cryptography. Uh, we want to get a basic understanding of how encryption works. Don't be intimidated. I find most people worry that they have to be cryptographers and many people over teach it. We're going to stay at the consumer level, just like driving a car. You do not have to be a mechanic, but there are some very important rules of the road you have to know or else it's, it's a very lethal thing. So let's uh, take a, a look at what I call the um, consumers level and we're going to tour the crypto mart. So I'm shopping in the crypto mart for four basic services. One, I want confidentiality. That's what most people think of. Confidentiality. All right, I'm going to make it secret. And it makes sense that most people would think of that because the word cryptography comes from the Greek. Uh, crypt means to hide uh, and graph means to write. So I'm going to write away that you won't understand. Maybe Bob and Alice can hide messages. And they can do that by sharing a symmetric key. All right, so that means Bob and Alice are going to have keys that look the same. Bob will share one with Alice, and now they can, well, let's say put it in a filing cabinet. Maybe, uh, Alicia, you and I could share keys. And if we shared keys together, uh, we could have confidential messages. Now, first of all, I have to, I have to share the key, and we'll get into that later, because I can't lock that in, up in secret. He could watch me give you the key, couldn't he? So we have uh, John, our, our director here, and I want to give um, Alicia the key, but I have to do that without him looking. All right, but let's assume we can do that. So now we have keys to a filing cabinet, right? And now I can share messages, and only you and I can see it, and they're confidential. But if you open up that um, filing cabinet and you see something in there that you know you didn't put in there, you could say that came from Larry. So you could authenticate, right? So authenticate means to validate the source. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So you yeah. open up and say, I didn't put that there. Right. So that's great. That's how passwords work. Really, it's just a, a, a symmetric key that we share with the server and the user. But suppose I put something in there, like a tuna fish sandwich. Um, I was too lazy to go to the refrigerator on Friday. I forgot about it. And it's three-day weekend. Tuesday morning, when your records smell like fish, you're not very happy, right? So you tell uh, the boss, and, and John calls me in the office, and I think I warned you that I'm from North Philadelphia, I'm from Logan, and when you say, Larry, why are you putting uh, tuna fish sandwiches in the filing cabinet? I go, I don't do it. Uh, Larry, you and Alicia are the only two people with the key. Now, you did it, or Alicia, how do you know Alicia ain't doing it? She's been acting weird, too. I think her and her boyfriend ain't getting along or something. She's been acting freaky. I tried to talk to her. I don't know, just snapping. Now, you'll know I'm lying, Alicia, but he can't tell. <laughs> so while we can authenticate, authenticate, say, like, hi, it's me, I can prove it. In legal uh, circles, repudiate means to deny. I can deny it. I can blame you. If we had an asymmetric key, where it's a little different, So now I have a lock key, and I give you my unlock key. They look different, but whatever I lock with my lock key, only my unlock key can unlock, and vice versa. If you lock it with my, un with my public key, say I can unlock it. But let's say I lock it, and only my unlock key goes. And now you say, Larry, it had to be you. So John says, Larry, it had to be you that uh, locked it up there because you didn't share a secret key. Symmetric is, is commonly called shared secret, by the way. 
shared secret and a quick test tip to anybody. Any key that begins with the letter S, shared secret session is a symmetric key. But uh, we didn't share this, so we don't share the blame. I kept one to myself. I kept this private. P R V, and this is public. I gave this out to anybody. My public key unlocked it. My private key was used. So now we have a new feature. You can't deny it. It's called non-repudiation. Non, can't do it. Repudiate, deny. T I O N. And mathematically, that's true. But I am still from North Philly. So, John, when you call me in there and say, Larry, it had to be you. Your public key unlocked it. Your private key had to be used. I would go, damn. Maybe someone made a copy of my key or picked the lock somehow. And that's a real threat. These are supposed to be private keys, but I've gone to um, Windows Update many times and found out that if I install this patch, somebody could have read something from my machine without having authorization. They could copy my private key. And these algorithms get cracked. So in theory, this would work. In practice, it doesn't always work that way. Now, um, another algorithm we have in the Crypto Mart is a hashing algorithm. And hashes are weird. When I hash something, I don't really encrypt it. Let's take a look at what I mean. Using cryptographic math, I want to just check for a change to a file. And this is analogous to say, um, I drop my car for the parking lot. And I want to make sure that um, they don't drive my car around. Now, we said security is about prevention, detection, response. But if this is the type of lot where I have to keep my key and give it to them, prevention's out of the water. So the only thing I have left now is detection and response. So, uh, edit, I'm too old here. Notepad. Uh, I'll be using Edlin next. Sorry, guys. Notepad hash test dot txt. And I'm going to create a very simple file, 0 through 9. Very simple file. Anybody can see that. You can look at it. And I, I run a hash tool against MD5 sum. MD5 sum space hash test dot txt. And I get some 128-bit message digest because it's in hex. So I know with one hex digit, I get four bits. Okay, so that's, uh, that's going to be 32 digits. It might be important, I'm just saying. Um, so I get this 128-bit picture of my car. And then I drop, I, okay, I drop my car off, and then I go to pick it up. And they go, here's your car, and I take a picture of it again. But unfortunately, while they had it, somebody, whatever, moved a mirror. I'm going to change this zero to a one. Uh, maybe they moved my seat. And I come back, and I take a picture of my car, and I go, whoa. I got a different, I got a different hash value here. Why does this picture look different? Something changed on my car. So a hash is cryptographic math, but not to encrypt, not to hide something, just to look for changes. And I say, I, I refuse to take this car until you fix it, and they put it back. And oh, I'm sorry, sir, we just moved a mirror, and now I they fixed it. And I double check, I run MD5. Okay, I got my original hash. So the idea of the hash is the same input will give me the same hash value. Different inputs will, will give me a different hash value. So if somebody took, say, Service Pack 2 for whatever, Windows 7, embedded a backdoor Trojan horse, I should know because I could run a hash against it and get a different number. But suppose I didn't drop my car at the parking lot. Suppose what it was, I, I went to the Internet. Uh, let me write that down, by the way. Hash gives us integrity. And the picture is actually taken by Honda. So I order a Honda car. I get a new Honda CRV, And they, they have a delivery guy come down. He drives with it. And the picture is on the car. And he dents the car. So he gets out and he pulls the picture out. He takes a new picture of it with a dent and puts it back in. So when I come in, I go, all right, let's see if that's the car. Well, I remember a dent. I don't remember ordering a car with a dent. And he goes, I don't know, check the picture. And I look at the picture. And I, go, I must have. Huh. The problem with these hash values is we have to authenticate them. So actually, the only reasons I've ever seen somebody use an asymmetric system, I could encrypt a hash value 
with my private key and the public would know that hash came from me. And if I did that, I would have authenticity. It did come from, that service pack came from Microsoft. It wasn't changed. Nobody embedded a backdoor Trojan horse into it. And Microsoft can't blame anybody. And that's known as a digital signature. Three of the four reasons we shop at the Crypto Mart have nothing to do with encrypting anything. This is why I find it difficult for people, it's the words we use. This is very important. Digital signatures are very important to us. It's not important to Microsoft who reads Service Pack 2. It's important to the consumer that it came from Microsoft. It was not altered. Microsoft can't blame anybody else. Now sometimes I do want confidentiality, of course. And one of the challenges is sharing that secret key, because when I give you the key, he could have taken a picture of it. I could have encrypted a key with your, let me use a different color here, with your public key. And the only time I ever see it, I'm going to use asymmetric systems to either encrypt hash values and sign something, or encrypt a symmetric key for key agreement, and now I can share my secrets much more securely. All crypto systems, I don't care if it's SSL, SSH, IPsec, PGP, and I get, the list goes on and on, SMIME, DNSSEC, mix and match some symmetric algorithm, some asymmetric algorithm, some hashing algorithm to give us these four services. That's our objective today. We just want to go through the crypto mart, mix and match three algorithms, something from aisle one, aisle two, and aisle three to get me these four services. So let's take a little closer look. Now, as you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, packet analyst, packet head, packet nerd. Um, and I like to do everything with Wireshark because we know packets don't lie. All right, so we just want to be an intelligent consumer. There's no uh, reason for us to be mathematicians or cryptographers any more than I need to be a mechanic. But I do want to understand how to shop there. So in aisle one of the crypto mart, I'm going to see these shared secrets. Things like RC4, AES. Um, maybe further on, you'd, you'd see two fish, blowfish. There's old DES out there. A lot of people still support that, triple DES. E0 used in Bluetooth. And... Um, in the asymmetric aisle, I'm going to see Diffie-Hellman, RSA, and ECC. That's all I ever see. Practice tests seem to sometimes focus on a couple others like Knapsack and El Gamal. Guys, they've been cracked years ago. Don't buy them. So the only ones I ever see used, uh, don't use that. Uh, and in aisle three, the hashing aisle, we're going to see MD5, SHA1 for the most part. There's SHA2, SHA3 came out last year. There's Skyne, there's Whirlpool, there's a number out there. Um, but on tests, I only seem to find that they're going to focus on MD5 and SHA1. All right. So using Wireshark, I sniff out an SSL handshake. And uh, most people, uh, by default in the old days, would pick a Type 4. And here you see, the, I could do RSA as my asymmetric algorithm. I can use RC4 as my symmetric algorithm. And I'll use MD5 as my hashing algorithm but they have many different choices that they could use. So let's tour down the, the symmetric aisle. All right, so again, this is what most people think of until, up until my lifetime, that's all we've had. Asymmetric encryption, hashing algorithms, these were created in the 70s. Symmetric algorithms, since we've had writing. Uh, so Bob wants to share a secret with Alice, but first they have to agree on the secret key. That key agreement is tough. The strength of this, though, assuming I can, is it's very fast because we're dealing with entropy. So if I have a one-bit key, I have two, uh, an entropy of two. I have eight bits, I have an entropy of 256. Asymmetric encryption doesn't work that way. I can't just go with every value. They have to be prime numbers, and it makes it a lot different. We'll get to that in aisle two, but let's just say that on average, a symmetric system is like a thousand times faster than asymmetric systems. So let's refer to the board again. What am I encrypting asymmetrically? I said using the sender's private, I can encrypt a hash value. This is rarely more than, say, on your test, 160 bits. But we have them up to 512. Right? That's still not even 
1K. What else might I be encrypting? Oh, using the public key, the receiver, I'll share this symmetric key. This symmetric key, when your test is rarely bigger than 256, Blowfish will go up to 448 bits, but it's not a K, it's not a meg, it's not a gig. That type of data is, is encrypted symmetrically. We only use the asymmetric system to encrypt keys and hash values. Um, the challenge is key agreement. How do I initially share the secret? So imagine I'm the mail admin for you, uh, Alicia, and I'm going to set you up for mail. Okay, I need you to log into mail, and you go, what's my username? It's Alicia Webb. Okay, it's my password. Oh, I don't want to say that in the clear. Here, I'll mail it to you. No, I can't get into email, Larry. Oh, let me mail it to you again. Did it get lost? Maybe it went into spam. No, there's a paradox there. I can't encrypt it. So that's a very big challenge. How do you share the secret? And it doesn't scale very well. And um, you can just remember the number 45. No, I'm sorry, I should take you through the math because actually it changes every year. But let's take a look at, the, at how the scalability of this works. And I ran into this with routers. So imagine I'm sharing, uh, I have these routers, they're gonna set up VPNs. So router A and B will have to share a secret. And now router C joins in and I'll have to share a secret and they'll have to share a secret. And then router D and now uh, A will have to share a secret with D. And, C. And then I route out F, or E rather, I'm jumping at, boom, boom. Wow, it's a lot. Router F. Now, router F doesn't have to share a secret with itself, but it will have to share it with everybody else. So, how many keys did I just draw? Well, the formula is N times N minus 1 divided by 2. Well, let's say I have. One, two, three. I have six routers times six minus one is five. That equals 30. But since they're shared, uh, I can divide that in half, and I have 15 keys. And if I had a 1,000 routers, I would need a half a million keys, or roughly that. And if this were an asymmetric system, i just need one key pair for everybody. Damn. Asymmetric systems scale a lot better. Most of the time, when we authenticate, we prefer to do that asymmetrically. It does give a security service a confidentiality. I can make secret messages and a limited form of authenticity. Alice will know this thing came from Bob, but Bob could blame Alice because when you share the key, you can share the blame. In asymmetric encryption, we create a key pair. Now, Alice is going to create a, a, a private public key pair. These are two related numbers. There are a couple ways to do this, and we'll, we'll talk about them. RSA versus diffie helmet Let's just think of uh, um, one basic way. I, I have a key that uh, whatever I do with uh, my, my private key can only be unlocked with my public key, or vice versa. Uh, you can, if you lock it up with my public key, only my private key can unlock it. And just looking at my public key, you shouldn't be able to figure out what my private key is. So just to, uh, to look at it, like how RSA could approach this, is it easier to multiply or divide? Same. It's a lot, a lot easier Nine. to multiply two numbers, right? I can go, uh, you know, 100 times 100 is, is you know, uh, 100,000, but it's way harder to look at a number divided. You've got to carry the one and figure out. It's, so it's very difficult to divide, and that's true on a computer as well. So um, I could take, now, uh, you'd want these to be bigger numbers, but let's say I took the only two numbers, uh, I'm going to give you 64, and I go, you have to know the two numbers multiplied into it that equals 64. And I think only 2 times 32, it will do that. So you, you wouldn't know how to open the safe. But actually, 4 times 16 would open that safe. Uh, 8 times, all right, so they got to be prime numbers. Mm -hmm. So if I gave you 21, now it's a small number. We can go 3 and 7, but only 3 and 7 besides 1 times 21. Let's make them real big numbers to where your computer could, could multiply the two out in a second, but to, in order to, to factor it back would take a trillion years. So you could give that product out to somebody and say, here's my public key. You don't have to know anything about my private key. Uh, and since, uh, the, well, I, I could put on the public key on Barack Obama, you better have a trusted third party validate for it. If the challenge of a symmetric system is sharing the secret, the challenge of an asymmetric system is validating the public key. So a trusted third party will create a hash of this, say using MD5, 128-bit hash. You say, I am Alicia Webb, and it's like a driver's license. It's good before this date, not after that date, and whatever. And then they create a hash, and then somebody, maybe a certificate authority like VeriSign, there are certificate authorities, and they have a private key, and they digitally sign that 
certificate. So the big challenge in asymmetric encryption is validating the public key. And we'll get into that more. I'm just introducing it. But since it has your name on it, it's actually your ID card. That's what a certificate really represents on the internet. When you get a certificate from whatever um, Gmail, it's really their ID card and you check their ID. And I like to check people's IDs. And you can check it with Wireshark. So here we go, I, I, uh, I downloaded um, a, a Gmail, uh, I went to Gmail, I got their certificate, and I took a look and I looked at their ID, it says we're mail.google.com, it's a signed certificate, um, the, the signature was actually, uh, they used SHA as the hashing algorithm, and their RSA private key, and we're gonna find out who signed that later on, um, and then I get the public key, and that's, that's what a public key is. The advantages of asymmetric over symmetric, well, first of all, I don't require sharing secrets. Take my public key, I don't care. Um, and it scales well. I just need one key pair for everybody. And it provides non-repudiation if you can trust that the algorithm were cracked and no one copied my key. But it is much slower. So again, we don't encrypt lots of data. If you made an email and you encrypted your email, you're doing that symmetrically. Then you're gonna sign the email asymmetrically. Uh, and it requires some trusted third party to vouch for the key. And there's two basic ways to do that. So as a Star Trek fan, I like to think, you know, the quantitative part of my brain is represented by Spock, but the subjective qualitative is Kirk. And Spock in me says that PKI is very logical, Captain. It's a hierarchy of trust models where I have roots and subordinates, and I could easily walk up that tree and logically find out what happened. And, but Kirk would be like, Spock, I've never met Verisign. Uh, he trusts his friend from the academy. If Flanagan signed that key, he's a good man. And one's not better than the other. I joke around that uh, sometimes I trust my friends more than the government. I don't know if the government's always telling me the truth, but there are a lot of times when I don't trust my friend either. Like, uh, hey, I should go. Oh, come on, one more shot, Green. That is not, I, I would trust the government. No, don't drive. I'm, I'm going to go with that one. All right, so uh, again, I can look at these certificates, I sniff them out, and uh, we can see you know, the issuer, the validity, and if we drill in, we'd see the dates. But it's an ID card just saying this truly is um, a, a, a Gmail, the, the, at least that's what I'm supposed to believe. I'm gonna check later on, see if I can really trust this ID. Because I'm from the neighborhood, man. But guys always had some phony ID. There's always some way to get something phony, so I'm <laughs> suspicious. As my mom said, that's what they want you to think. Well, come on, that's how they get you. Uh, by the way, it's a handy Wireshark uh, filter if you are using Wireshark, uh, SSL handshake certificate, and you can filter out and see those certificates. All right, so again, this is supposed to be Gmail. Um, the Cypher suite will tell me what they actually selected. So even though uh, I could have done, say, uh, and, and that initial type four was to use uh, RC4 as my symmetric key and um, RSA as my asymmetric, in this case, they chose Wow, they chose, and I know this is Google, only Google seems to be this advanced. They chose the elliptical curve crypto system, the most efficient asymmetric algorithm, uh, to do the key agreement. And I could tell because they got the patent, they had, to, they had to give a homage to Diffie-Hellman. So we're gonna use elliptical curve as a Diffie-Hellman exchange. But I still have to use RSA to sign this SHA hash. So again, elliptical curve, ECD at Diffie-Hellman will be used to generate this AES 128-bit key but RSA will be used to sign that hash. Where should I encrypt? What should, I, should I encrypt data? Do I encrypt it with my hard drive? Do I encrypt uh, just an SSL session? Now, when I first started using encryption was when I was doing banking online and, and buying stuff. In fact, that was the big push to upgrade your browser from 40-bit to 128-bit, if everybody remembers that. Um, and uh, I go to, to um, uh, Amazon and I purchase things and my credit card's encrypted. But the headers aren't encrypted. The, the, the TCP header, the IP set, why would I care? Why should I care if, as long as my credit card's encrypted? Why do I care if the header? I don't, I don't care because I'm just going to Amazon. But if I was going to some place where I didn't want you to know where I was going, then I might encrypt more. So uh, for me, um, was, was transport layer, in fact, that's a cell was renamed to TLS, so transport layer security, would encrypt all my data. If we look at this uh, diagram down here, all the way from this Internet Explorer 
uh, web browser. The data is encrypted, none of the headers. Routers are, are great with that because they can pass that. I can see all the routers need is the IP address and that's fine. And it goes all the way through to this Outlook Web Access server running on 443 and we know from the test that's probably running uh, SSL, right? So that stays encrypted but none of the headers. Uh, IPsec is kind of cool. I can encrypt uh, an IPsec session from this workstation all the way to that workstation. Now if I do, I can't encrypt the headers because the routers need to see it. But I have another issue with that. My IDSs can't look at it. So I don't really like to have workstations do that if I don't need to. IPsec allows me to do tunnel mode, what I would encrypt from some perimeter end device. So my workstations, I don't have to configure them specially. They get uh, their original packet tunneled in through an encrypted channel, comes back out, nice. Wi-Fi is a little different. When I do like, um, my uh, WPA, WPA2, I'm encrypting everything behind the frame header, but it terminates at the access point. So the router can decrypt it, look up the headers, and then everything else is clear text. Some people do link layer encryption. And like if you're a military and you're worried about people looking at who are you talking to, uh, encrypted here, decrypted here, encrypted here, decrypted here, encrypted here, decrypted. A lot of, very cumbersome. So uh, when you're doing link layer encryption, I gotta get keys at every router. More keys I have, the harder it is to maintain. Now, when I encrypt an email, I could encrypt, say Bob could encrypt everything with Alice's public key, and she'd be the only one to read it. She, her private key would be the only thing decrypted. But it's like a thousand times slower. So we'd rather use a symmetric system. So Bob's email client, whether PGP or SMIME, will just randomly think of a number. So if I picked, um, say, AES at 128 bits to be my algorithm, my symmetric algorithm, I'm just going to randomly make up a 128-bit number or pseudo randomly generate it. And I'll use that to encrypt the mail. But now we have the problem of sharing the key. Now, a lot of times on tests, they say the challenge, like I said, how did I get you the key? He could have taken a picture, and they always say, you use an out-of-band key exchange. In the private sector, that is typically yellow sticky. That's why yellow sticky is the prize jewel of any dumpster diver. That's where passwords and initial keys are written. So uh, in this case, he said, no, I'll just mail it to her. But then anybody could see it. No, he's going to encrypt the session key with Alice's public key. So now I have the body of the message that was encrypted symmetrically. And we get the speed of the symmetric encryption. But to share that key, I encrypted it with Alice's public key. So now I get the key agreement sharing of asymmetric. I get the best of both worlds. So you see we call it a digital envelope. I haven't heard that term in over 15 years, I think. So now it's called a uh, just hybrid encryption. So Alice's first step to read this email, well, she's got to get the symmetric key back. It was locked up with her public. She could use her private. Her private key pulls out the uh, symmetric key. Using the symmetric key, she can read the message. And unfortunately, uh, they are engineers, and this is a love letter, and she's, she's flattered, but really she only likes him as a friend. No, no, I'm sorry, just, just venting, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I go out, my, my brother was, I, I just vent because my brother was like Kirk, and I was like Spock, and my brother's really good at going to clubs and meeting chicks, and he'd say the dumbest things. He'd be like, I feel like a margarita. And she's like, yay! And I'd be like Spock, all logical, and I get fascinating, and yet logical, considering strawberries are in season. <laughs> and they'd be like, mm, you know, whatever. But I'll tell you what, now that we're like over 50, they don't go by looks anymore. They go by Larry's house is paid for. He's got a good job. No, I don't know. And he travels a lot. You don't have to deal with him much. All right, now that we know how to encrypt stuff, let's check the integrity of these things. So hashing algorithms, I said, it doesn't really encrypt. It just checks a change. And when I run a hash, that's a shorter, fewer keystrokes. What I really have is a message digest. So that's why it's called MD5. It's for message digest number five. But it's not authenticated. Who created that hash? It's like the guy who, you know, when the delivery guy comes over with the car and has a picture. So I could authenticate symmetrically. Uh, that's a message authentication code. Why would I do that instead of digitally signed when I just encrypt the hash? Well, it's faster. But I suppose I need non-repudiation. Be careful. I want to show you guys something that tests won't ever ask you properly, but consider why in IPsec we don't digitally sign the packets. In IPsec, which we will look at again in the session hijacking section, I have my original payload. This is the data. It might include my TCP or UDP segment header. And then I have an IP packet header. And in the packet header, 
I have two very important fields. I have the source IP and I have the destination IP. And if I run MD5 against these, and I get some 128-bit value, and they didn't change, I don't need not repudiation because I know it came from the source and not from the destination, and it's faster. That's why they chose that, but I warn you, nobody ever thinks that way on a test. Now, I didn't see it here on, on this particular test, but every time I've taken a test, does IPsec provide non-repudiation? Just say no. I could argue it in court, though. But if you really want it, that does not work in, say, uh, when I download an email, when I download a service pack, when I get my uh, receipt from, um, say, the uh, EC Council for signing up for their test. Uh, these things have to be hashed and then encrypted. The hash is encrypted with the sender's private, and this will give us non-repudiation. So I need to make sure, again, that the, my antivirus signature updates. It's not important to Symantec who reads them. It's important to me as a consumer that these updates came from Symantec, were not altered, and Symantec can't blame anybody else. So we digitally sign those things. So again, uh, message I just by itself, not authenticated. When I authenticate it symmetrically, I have a message authentication code. It gives me authenticity, it gives me integrity, but technically I don't have non-repudiation. A digital signature, I get all of it. So this is typically what happens um, when Bob uh, signs a message. And this is what happens to you when, when you get like a service pack from Microsoft. Microsoft creates the service pack. They run a, a hash against it. Then using their private key, they encrypt the hash. An encrypted hash is the signature. So when you see digital signature, what you're looking at is an encrypted hash value. So when you download, and this happens in the background for you, anytime you download a service pack, a virus signature update, an email that was signed, um, you calculate a hash value. Using their public key, you decrypt theirs. And if that matches, then likely the service pack did not change, it did come from Microsoft, and Microsoft can't blame anybody else. In theory. The problem is, our hashing algorithms have been cracked. Uh, I was in China in 2004 teaching a class, and uh, I read that um, uh, Shanyan Wang and three of her uh, students in Shandong University cracked MD5. Now, I'd like to think that I had something to do with it. I'm sure I had nothing to do with it. But uh, it was cool. I pick on China a lot, but I don't pick on Chinese people. They were very friendly about it. They, they, she announced that they didn't have, did not have to tell us. But I consider this is 2004, and then eight months later, they found holes in SHA. So I've been saying, man, how hard is it going to be for somebody to create a backdoor uh, embedded into a service pack, get the hash value to come out the same as Microsoft's, and I presented this out at uh, SharkFest last June in Berkeley, and a couple of weeks later, Flame Virus comes out, and that's exactly what happened. Flame Virus, uh, uh, somebody was able to um, create a service pack, this is how I it, uh, get it to hash to, to what it looked like Microsoft signed it. And what I didn't consider was how did I get the guy to run my service pack? They uh, hacked a Windows Update protocol. So when, you're, when you have auto-update on, you're constantly uh, asking update service, does anybody have an update for me? And they answered, yes, we do. And they gave it to them. And it seemed to only affect Iran. So many people think that was created by the United States and Israel. All right, so we can sniff these things out. And again, here's my signature. And again, I can see this was an SHA hash where it was encrypted uh, with their RSA key. And now I can see that the signer was actually thought. So the reason I trust that this key came from uh, you know, is really Google, is because Thought said it is, they signed it. Well, why do I trust Thought? Why do I trust Thought? Well, because they are ISO approved trusted third parties. So in other words, they're approved by the Federation, so to speak. Uh, I hope so. Because if I were a hacker and I really, really want to take over things, I would, I would get bogus uh, CA, trusted root CAs in here. I don't know how many people rightly check this, but we'll worry about that later. But I already have thoughts public key. 
So when I generated that, with, uh, they generate a hash, I generate a hash, and I can decrypt it, but I look at their, their public key, and uh, I generate a hash on the certificate, and I should get the same signature that they did. And I can decrypt it because I have Thought's public key with me. All right, that's the theory. Who is really that trusted third party? Again, uh, to me, Spock would always prefer uh, PKI, the, the digital certificate concept by the Federation. Um, but Kirk, uh, I've never met them, and he's going to go with his hunch. And one is not better. It's going to depend on your needs. Or sometimes I don't trust myself. Um, but using uh, the PKI's tr uh, hierarchical trust model, I could have roots and subordinates. Like, I may want to administer my own stuff. So I could. I could get a subordinate CA where you know, Bob could administer all of his things, but then when he gets something from Alice, they could walk up to the root. And this is why we have what's known as the hierarchical trust model. Right. And we could see that, that it was thought was the CA that signed it. Never on test, guys, but so you can defend yourself. I've done some research here, and I'm a little confused. Apparently, according to the RFCs, thought, verisign are not the um, uh, root. They got the right to become a CA from the policy certification authorities. Where did they get the right? At the top tier, the Internet Policy Registration Authority, and I can't find them now. When I did, they looked like this. This was the root of all trust on the Internet. At first, I thought this was created in Notepad, and then I said, Larry, you can't get these type of fonts in Notepad. It's probably WordPad. This bothered me. I'm sorry. If this is the root, and then I went a little further. This was created, by the way, by Jeff Schiller. So Jeff Schiller, at this point, is the root of all trust. And I feel like I've just gotten to, the, the, I'm meeting the Wizard of Oz, and it's a man behind a curtain. And you can, you can get their certificate by clicking here. I like PKI. It's the best thing I know of to validate who's who, and we have to get better at it. But right now, it's about as secure as Swiss cheese. It's gotten worse. Suppose... On my driver's license, I, I, they check it and it says, okay, everything looks good, but my driver's license was revoked. That's not printed on my driver's license. It's got to make a call. All right. So certificate revocation is supposed to work by checking a list. So let's take a look at it. Let me bring up Wireshark here. Let's see how that's supposed to work. And we know packets don't lie. And Here's a uh, previous one. I put in one of my favorite. I saved it as a... Uh, uh, as a preset, so I can go, just go to certificate, and I can see some certificates, and I um, open up the SSL. Here's the certificate. Take a look and see if we can trust this. Where is the certificate revocation list? How can I see if his driver's license was revoked? And they kind of bury this down here, but these are in the extensions. And uh, at least the CRL one's kind of obvious. It says CRL. Uh, this is really buried down here. But this is where I'm supposed to go. I'm the cop pulling you over, and I want to see, where did you get your driver's license? Oh, you got it from the Department of Motor Vehicles at thought.com. So I go there and I check. And that sounds like a great idea, but the list got really, really long. So Microsoft, thank you, came up with a way to speed up processing. Uh, it turns out you go to Advanced, and you go down to check for server certificate revocation. If you turn that off, everything's much faster. They did that in XP and they did that in 96. Please put that back on if you still have any of those machines. But the algorithms got cracked. And besides, that's a lot to do, right? Isn't that a lot to do? Ask you, oh, come on, uh, give me the whole list. One of the fields in a certificate is a serial number. Why don't I just ask you, is that serial number good? And if the uh, certificate supports that, and it's not as obvious as CRL distribution point, it's uh, authority info access. We're going to drill down there and see, do you support another way for me to get there? Oh, I could use OCSP. I could go to ocsp.thought.com. That's the online certificate status protocol to see 
if this serial number is good. And not everybody supports it, but let's see, OCSP, did they support it? Yes, I could request it, and then I got an answer. Uh, so the request is this serial number good? All right, so I say, is this serial number good? And then I got a, a reply, and don't worry about this trunk, it's a wire shark issue, we're not gonna get into that. But basically it says uh, the response data is, um, well, maybe, yes, it's good. All right, so it sounds good. But here's uh, what I found. If you can't get to the CRL or the OCSP server, it's kind of like a cop doing this. All right, let me just see if this driver's license has been suspended, Miss Whip. They're not answering. All right, you can go. All browsers have been configured to fail soft. Sometimes you turn it on and you can't get to it. And I just, you know, I do music stuff and a lot of music guys don't sign this stuff. And if I don't accept it, all right, just go. Certificate revocation is unavailable. Uh, let's go back to that list of Microsoft search. This is pretty cool, too. Now, the first time I ever dealt with... Uh, with certificates before I actually point this out. I had to do a VPN, IPsec VPN, and we're gonna do mutual authentication. So doctors are gonna to authenticate to the server, to, and the, so the doctors know it's the hospital, the hospital knows it's a doctor. And once I get the IPsec tunnel, I don't feel like working and driving through Philly traffic. So uh, I asked the customer, do you mind, um, now that the VPN's up if I work from my house? And he goes, oh, I'm gonna be out next week anyway, Larry. So here, here's what I got from VeriSign. He hands me this letter. And, um, you know, just work on what we meet next week, you know, a week from now, we'll find out. Okay, so now Monday morning, I read the instructions. You must download the admin cert. Okay, so I go to, uh, I'll follow this, with this, these instructions at this website. I follow it. Then I read it, it says, now call this phone number. I call this phone number. Hi, this is Larry Greenblatt. I work for Internet Network Defense. I need to download Bob. I'm sorry, who is this? Larry Greenblatt. I'm sorry. We can only speak to Bob. No, you don't want to speak to Bob. He's not very technical. That's why he hired me. And besides, he's not in this. I'm sorry, sir. That's how it works. Oh, okay. Do, 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 do. Hi, this is Bob. I need to download my admin cert. Fine, point your browser to this location. Now, I did that for a hospital. When we go to that content publishers we had trusted, there are untrusted. And for years, all you ever saw were two. These two. I did it for a hospital. This guy called VeriSign, and he got two subordinate root search pretending to be Microsoft. I just picked it. Yeah, first name Mike, last name Rosoft. That's awesome. But then it got much worse recently. In 2010, DigiNotar, a CA, got their private key hack. Now, they were issuing certificates for little-known companies. Uh, Alicia, have you ever heard of uh, Skype or Yahoo or Google? I think yeah, so. Yeah, well, apparently, they were given, you might have their search, and they're known fraudulent. Uh, it's awesome. The algorithms have been cracked. This, the certificates from the roots, and, oh, it's really great. Why is that hard-coded in here? Why didn't they put that on a CRL? What are they telling us about CRLs? Well, I'm not the only one thinking this, so uh, I, I won't read this whole thing down, but let me skip ahead here. Um, guys at the tour project, and what we just saw on the slides, what I just went through, so it's no big deal. They noticed that these, these lists were given out to us hard-coded, and it made them out as worse. Chrome's list was different than Microsoft's, different than uh, Firefox. We're like, oh my, this is bad. So just in a nutshell, I like this one, the bullet. Uh, does certificate revocation really work? No, it does not. But we're not gonna panic. This is like the Wild West. We're gonna figure things out. We're gonna make something cool happen. Our grandkids are gonna thank us. We're gonna figure it out. Uh, there's an old, uh, let me just end it with one thing. So Bruce and I are a great, great hero. In, in, uh, they have uh, uh, fun facts about um, uh, Chuck Norris, well, they have him for Bruce Schneider. Bruce, our, uh, facts, and uh, there's a couple of them. That I'll just read uh, one or two, but I want you to see one that's particularly interesting. So uh, I, I, here's one of my favorite. Bruce Schneider's secure handshake is so strong, you won't be able to exchange keys with anyone else for days. But look at this one. It's just some cryptic message. Well, you feed it into a tool, I won't waste your time here, but it comes down to, if you ask Bruce Schneider to decrypt this, he'd crush your skull with his laugh. 
Uh, as I said, though, I'm, I, you know, when I see these things break down, I, I'm not worried. We're gonna we're gonna figure it out. I work with a lot of Marines, and I love that uh, motto of theirs: "You'll improvise, you adapt, you overcome." And that completes this module. Now we hope you've enjoyed this free module, but there's lots more. The Cyber Kung Fu course has 29 videos in all and will really help build you a solid understanding of the CEH version 8 curriculum. Don't forget, if you prefer to attend one of Secure Ninja's courses in person at any of our training locations, you really need to visit secureninja.com slash specials for some amazing discounts and other deals. I'm Alicia Webb. Happy training. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.